the, the country's farmers are in a very bad situation for a few reasons, uh, one of which, uh, uh, like geography-wise, where they are, um, Siberian winds from the north are coming in, and so farming is like incredibly difficult. Um, and one solution to that would be for their government to expand um, uh, usable land for farming, because that way they would just be able to increase the amount of production, like basically by as much as they wanted. But uh, instead, the government is forcing their people to double crop, which is uh, basically planting two um, different um, crops in the same field, which doesn't work at all because their soil isn't like it, it can't handle it basically. So it's just again made the situation worse. Um, uh, economically wise, the North Korean people are in a horrible shape, and their bad economy is the biggest factor in their poverty crisis. Um, if, the North, if the North Korean people can't get themselves out of this bad situation, there's going to be a lot of issues coming with death. Um, um, uh, they had a famine uh, about 20 years ago where I believe it was like 5 million people died. 3.3? 3, 3, 3 million people died. And so I could foresee a repeat of that happening because basically their, their poverty crisis and their hunger crisis has like reached a boiling point and uh, with, the, uh, with the new sanctions that came in. Um, but some solutions for that where the government could potentially dig their people out of that hole would be one, to drop their military spending. Um, because if you're not spending five billion dollars a year on your military, then you have more money to give to your people. Um, they could cease their nuclear their uh, nuclear program and stop building more weapons and uh, start uh, the deconstruction of weapons, which would you know uh, you know allow the international scene to take back the sanctions they're placed on them because there's no longer that nuclear threat coming out of North Korea. And with that, with the extra money and the less sanctions, they could focus on their internal welfare of the people, help their hunger crisis, help the poverty crisis, get the country like, up and going again. Um, but unfortunately, it, it doesn't look like they're going to do that. It doesn't seem like the North Korean government is interested in doing that. Um, which brings us to our next lens, governmental lens. So I have these political lens. And um, the North Korean government spends the majority of the time and resources on the military and nuclear arsenal instead of their people. And South Korea has spent $8 million of food aid to North Korea to help end the poverty crisis. They've sent lots of money to help them, and there has still been a large poverty crisis and food crisis there, which did not make sense. And we realized that the problem isn't getting the resources, it's distributing the resources. So when the government receives the aid that they get from South Korea and other nations, they keep it within their own government and don't outsource it to the people they need. Um, there was, in the 1990s, a huge food shortage which resulted in 3.4 million people dying. This was due to a huge crop devastation, and it was the largest in history of North Korea. And um, one of the reasons was because of the crop devastation, but the other was because their leader, Kim Jong-un, he did not steal, did not see it as a necessity to look to other nations for help. And so he remained in country and tried to grow their food inside their country, but that's not a viable option because one, as Sterling said, their environment is not arable and their land is not equipped to grow that much food for all other people without going to other people for help. And so he refused to go to other countries to receive the help that they needed. As you know, they spend all of, or the majority of their resources on the military, and their government is focused around their power that they hold using fear over their people through their military. And in 2016 alone, they launched two nuclear tests and 20 missile tests, which is a lot more than other countries spend on their military. Okay, so I have the historical lens. That's the last thing that we'll be looking at this problem from. So North Korean camps. These camps have been like set up over the years to like help 
not help the world, to help the government grow, basically, which don't really work. These camps are said to be the worst camps ever made, and a survivor of the Auschwitz camp actually said that these camps were way worse because a lot of people there are being sexually assaulted, tortured, beaten, a lot of things. Like this one man, he tried to escape and was talking bad about the government. So they found him, they stripped him, hung him upside down in like, it was like a public hanging kind of sort of. So these camps don't really help. Them. Yeah, these are, these are prison camps. So they take their prisoners and people who have spoken about against the government and take them. In these camps, there are four major camps, and there are 130,000 North Koreans separated into these camps, and the total population is 25 million. So. North Korea's economy is made for them to fail. Since the separation, when the Soviet Union left in 1945, they have made a education structure or social structure that kind of guides their citizens to either be a government worker, a mechanic, or a scientist. So in the general school, which is like our pre-K to 12th grade, they kind of all have subjects that guide them that will either help them replace a government worker when they die or if they get executed, something like that. Or they are all workers, which start at very young ages. They all have like child labor, which help them grow into these different job choices. Okay. The people need food. So as Sterling said, an average North Korean makes two to three dollars a month, which is very low because 70% of the whole country is on, like, needs food aid. And it's kind of crazy how they expect their people to thrive and live lives when most of their people need food aid, and most of them are very undernourished. And most of the children have to work to help provide for their family and help get the simple things they need, like food. They need money for like toiletries, water, things like that. So a lot of the government is kind of just there to, it's not really helping them. It's there to keep them alive, but not to help them grow as people. And along with that, the government has influenced education too much with all the regulations and different kind of, well, camps to separate the people in. Like, the government has lied to the people about their literacy rates. Literacy rates go from, youth is from 15 to 24, and then adults is, 20, is 15 and up. So they have told their citizens that they have a 100% literacy rate, which is not true. And they tell them that their education is the best and that they're getting the best education that they can, which is really not true. Because when a lot of people escape and make it to North, I mean South Korea, they find that they're having to be re-educated because the things that they learn and what they know isn't really quality education. And it's only meant for them to stay inside of North Korea. And that's another big thing because the North Korean government kind of wants to keep everyone inside of their country, isolated from everyone else, so the country can stay a true communist place and everyone can grow to be a real communist, which is not really helpful because with this kind of government, no one can really grow and our reform is very needed because with this, there's going to be a con continuous cycle of poverty and no one is really going to thrive because they can't with this educational structure and government. Along with that, the government has put rules inside of their schools. Like, education is free in North Korea, but in all schools, you have to pay for like your desk, your toiletries, like things in the bathroom, like you have to pay for like the water, the toilets. I mean, like, Toilet tissue, napkins, things like that. You also pay for heat in the building as well. Yeah. So it then becomes very expensive to go yeah. to school. And so with uh, an average salary of two to three dollars a month, who can pay for that? All all this extra stuff just for the kid to get a somewhat questionable education. So this also guides kids into starting to have to work early so they can help provide for their family and pay for their education if they get an education. Because if they don't, then they'll either just be a person of part of the military or they'll become a, a farmer. Yeah, a farmer or something that doesn't really 
have any need any education. Thank you. All right. We have some questions for this team. <laughs> All right, so here are some questions I'd like to ask you. Um, let me ask this one of Sterling. This one. Right. Sterling, how did you decide which perspectives to use in your argument? Um, well, I think writing our papers, we all looked at it through a certain lens. I looked at mine through an economic lens, and look at history, political lens, and depth of history, historical lens. And so that kind of like helped us decide what aspects we're going to put into our presentation. Like we already had evidence pertaining to our specific lens, and so it just made things easier, I guess. Why did you, your team decide to pick those three? Um, well, since we were kind of focusing on like the poverty crisis and the hunger crisis, those seemed like the most relevant um, uh, lenses. Like economically wise, you know, that's basically right, you know, hand in hand with poverty. Uh, and uh, their poverty was uh, specifically, like, really influenced by the government. So having a political lens was also, you know, really, you know, made a lot of sense. And then, you know, North Korea has been in this situation for a long time. So looking at it historically also helped. Um, you could, like, compare their um, situation in, like, the 90s to now. And uh, you know, history is all about looking into the past and like, learning stuff about it. So it just uh, made a lot of sense. Okay, great. I think this one is going to be, let me ask Jeb in this one. What contribution did you make that facilitated the process of writing and revising the line of reasoning for your team and then developing the presentation? What was your role in the line of reasoning? My role, I guess we all had a big role because our group, every, like all the lenses kind of tied together. So with writing it, we all had information from our individual papers that helped in each other's like big kind of topic that we would talk about in the presentation. So I guess you could say that me like saying like, well, you have this and you can use it for a political lens or I have this and you can use it for a uh, economic lens. Stuff like that, they kind of like. Helped. Okay, thank you. And I'll have to have one more for, let's see. Can I, can I ask one? Yes, you can. Um, team, so team members can always with, jump in uh, and hop out. Really? Like, I didn't know that. Um, <laughs> I, I mean, no, I'm not like changing the answer. I just want to add something on that. Okay. Um, we, uh, a lot of our information kind of work with each other because uh, North Korea, you know, it is very secluded. And so there isn't like a lot of that out there. There are some, some solid evidence. So we, we ended up like having a lot of the same evidence. So it was cool to, to kind of see how we could each use it in different ways. Yeah. And then, yeah. Excellent, because I noted that as well. This one's for Ansel. Describe your thought processes as you prepare to deliver the argument to an audience. Which points did you want to ensure would be touched on in the presentation? How did um, you decide that? What was the most important? Well, going back to our process for starting our presentation, we looked back at our papers a lot, and that was our source for information. And can you repeat the question? Yes. Um, describe your thought processes as you prepare to deliver your argument to an audience. Which points did you want to ensure would be emphasized? Yeah, so um, we worked together when writing our papers and we shared information with each other and information that we found kind of tied in with each other. So I found information on the famine that happened in the 90s where 3.4 million people had died and I know that Devin was working on the historical lens. So I shared that with him and we both collaborated with that information. And so really when working on our PowerPoint for our presentation, we just looked back at the information we acquired all together that we shared with each other and put that into it. Okay. All right. Excellent. Give them a hand. Thank you for going, guys.
Good job, good job.